There are two bones of the forearm, the radius, which is located laterally, and the ulna. Both bones are illustrated here together with the right-sided humerus and put together so that they resemble the elbow joint. Let us start first with description of the ulna. What you see is the proximal part of the ulna and it shows its lateral surface. Ulna is very easy to recognize because it has a very unique proximal part which is shaped like a letter C and it is considered to be a very good, almost perfect match for articular surface that we have seen earlier on the distal humerus, the trochlea humeri. The rest of the ulnar body appears to be slightly curved and as we will see it in a moment there will be several features that we can identify in it while we approach the distal end of the bone which appears to be disproportionately smaller and perhaps a little bit of a surprise because ulna will have a very limited role to form the radioulnar or the wrist joint. Let's start description of the ulna going from proximal to distal direction as it is frequently the cause in describing long bones of the skeleton. First and foremost, what makes ulna very easy to distinguish between other bones of the skeleton is the deep C-shaped notch which will fit trochlea humeri, therefore this notch is simply called the trochlear notch of the ulna. It is marked superiorly with a very massive olecranon process which essentially is part of the elbow that we can feel whenever we have elbows brought in full flexion. Inferiorly there is another projection and that one is called a coronoid process. So the trochlear notch is marked between olecranon process and a coronoid process. In order to orient the bone properly one has to look for a specific feature that will directly point whether this bone is right-sided or left-sided. In this case I suggest that we take a look and find additional articular surface which is seen immediately inferior but lateral to the trochlear notch. This is articular surface that will match the radial head therefore ulna and the radius will assemble the proximal radio ulnar joint. This indented surface is known as the radial notch of the ulna. Immediately inferior to it we're going to see another interesting area which is shaped a little bit like a triangle and this area of the bone is known as the supinator fossa. Supinator fossa will offer origin for the muscle with the same name, the supinator muscle, and based on the activity of the muscle during the life, there might be another ridge that this muscle produces. It is called the supinator crest. Both landmarks are found immediately inferior to the radial notch of the ulna. Let's take another look at the proximal ulna, but this time more from the interior direction. So this is the lateral surface where we've seen the supinator fossa and the supinator crest. This is the radial notch of the ulna, so I will turn the bone practically by about 90 degrees in order to show anterior surface. So about a couple of centimeters inferior to the coronoid process of the ulna, there will be area which shows marked irregular surface of the bone. Let's try just to see whether we can zoom in in order to identify the area which is called the ulnar tuberosity. Ulnar tuberosity is this segment of the bone here and it is something that needs to be related to insertion of the brachialis muscle. Brachialis muscle is considered to be the main most powerful elbow flexor. Many people would add immediately biceps brachii muscle. It is muscle that definitely supports flexion of the elbow. However, it is not considered to be the main or principal muscle of elbow flexion. Let's take a closer look now to the body or shaft of the ulna. Here, on its anterior surface, one can see this little opening 
which is recognized as the nutrient foramen. Nutrient foramen served to allow major blood vessel, while this bone was still in the process of formation, to pass into cartilaginous model and to initiate the process of ossification. Ulnar shaft is not completely cylindrical. We're going to see a couple of interesting ridges. One of them, which I'm trying now to put into focus, is margin that is oriented laterally. So we can see here orientation that we already have, the radial notch of the ulna, supinator fossa, and in theory to the supinator fossa there will be this very sharp bony edge which is called the interosseous border of the ulna. Needless to say, that is the attachment point for the interosseous membrane that will connect shafts of the radius and ulna. Posteriorly, as we start from the olecranon process, which we can also see as part of the bone showing quite a few irregularities because this is insertion point for tendon of the main elbow extensor, which is the triceps brachii muscle. Going inferiorly from the olecranon process, we are going to observe appearance of not so prominent and not so visible posterior border of the ulna. However, this landmark is something that we can feel directly under our skin as it will allow us to palpate the ulna practically all the way from posterior elbow all the way down to the distal and lateral wrist. Finally, we arrived at the distal end of the ulna. There is something that appears to be a bit of a problematic term for many students to accept because we get used to see bones and we are experiencing quite a few bones which would have part named the head or the caput which appears to be also the most proximal or most superiorly oriented part of the bone. Alna in this case starts setting the new trend that will be also seen within the skeleton of the hand that quite a few bones would have their heads oriented inferiorly or distally. In this case this rounded inferior end of the bone is simply termed the ulnar head. The ulnar head itself is also covered with a hyaline cartilage as it appears to be entirely articular surface which meets the distal radius and at this location radius and ulna assemble the distal radio ulnar joint. It is interesting to stress out that ulna as a bone which is very important for movement of the elbow is going to have very little importance for stability and generally speaking assembly of the wrist joint that role will be very generously allocated to the radius. Inferiorly on the ulnar head we're going to see a small inferiorly oriented projection which is known as the styloid process a styloid process will serve as the attachment point for multiple ligaments that will run between distal ulna, namely the styloid process, and several bones of the hand skeleton, particularly the pisiform, the hamate, and to the base of the fifth metacarpal bone. Let us take another look and quickly review the bone that we just covered in this video. Proximal ulna. This is where we see the olecranon the coronoid process and the deep C-shaped notch, the trochlear notch of the ulna. This is proximal ulna, lateral view, therefore we are seeing articular surface for the radial head, the radial notch of the ulna, immediately inferior to it comes the supinator fossa and the supinator crest. If we continue further down we will be able to see continuation of the crest into the interosseous border or interosseous margin of the ulna which we can follow all the way down to the distal radius and finally we can see here the ulnar head together with the styloid process and we can see here that ulnar head has a nice smooth articular surface for forming the distal radio ulnar joint.